can I tell you about this book? Um, it, you know, I, I realized that All Over Creation was published in 2003, and now it is 2013, which means that there's been 10 years between these books, and, um, and that's a considerable amount of time uh, passing. And it really makes me understand that books are time beings, too. And they take the time they take to write. And, um, and you know, as much as one would like it to be otherwise, you know, as much as one would like to be a fast writer, as much as one would like to put out books more, you know, more frequently, sometimes that just doesn't happen. And um, what I've learned, you know, I've really learned in this, in this decade, this past decade, um, I've learned two things. One is that I'm a very impatient person. And the other is that I'm a very slow writer. And these, <laughs> these, two, these two things do not play nicely uh, with each other. But I have to say that, that writing this book has been um, an opportunity to really investigate my own relationship with time and the way that I, I you know, sort of push against it and I struggle with it. And, um, and I think that the book has been an outgrowth of this investigation of time. Um, other things happened in this past in, in this past decade. Um, I uh, lost my mother after taking care of her. Uh, she had Alzheimer's, and I think that informed the book as well. You know, so all of these different kinds of things informed the book, and it was sort of um, floating around in the gyre of my mind, and uh, and and found a home um, in in the book. So I don't want to talk too much about it now. I think I'll start by uh, by doing some reading, and um, and then we can kind of open it up for questions. Um, let's see now. Why don't we start at the beginning? The, the book is, uh, is told in two different voices. Um, one is the voice of a 16-year-old Japanese schoolgirl named Nao, Nao Yastani. And uh, the second voice is um, a novelist uh, living on a island in Desolation Sound, British Columbia, um, named, uh, named Ruth. So, uh, and I'll just read from the beginning um, of, the, of the book, so you get a sense of the two voices. Now, one. Hi. My name's Now, and I'm a time being. Do you know what a time being is? Well, if you give me a moment, I will tell you. A time being is someone who lives in time, and that means you and me and every one of us who is or was or ever will be. As for me, right now, I'm sitting in a French maid cafe in Akiba Electricity Town, listening to a sad chanson that's playing sometime in your past, which is also my present, writing this and wondering about you somewhere in my future. And if you're reading this, then maybe by now you're wondering about me too. You wonder about me. I wonder about you. Who are you, and what are you doing? Are you in a New York subway car hanging from a strap or soaking in your hot tub in Sunnyvale? Are you sunbathing <coughs> on a sandy beach in Phuket or having your toenails buffed in Abu Dhabi? Are you a male or a female or somewhere in between? Is your girlfriend cooking you a yummy dinner or are you eating cold Chinese noodles from a box? Are you curled up with your back turned coldly towards your snoring wife, or are you eagerly waiting for your beautiful lover to finish his bath so you can make passionate love to him? Do you have a cat, and is she sitting on your lap? Does her forehead smell like cedar trees and sweet, fresh air? Actually, it doesn't matter very much, because by the time you read this, everything will be different, and you will be nowhere in particular, flipping idly through the pages of this book, which happens to be the diary of my last days on earth, wondering if you should keep on reading. And if you do decide not to read anymore, hey, no problem, because you're not the one I was waiting for anyway. But if you do decide to read on, then guess what? You're my kind of time being, and together we'll make magic. Two. Ugh. That was dumb. I'll have to do better. I bet you're wondering what kind of stupid girl would write words like that. Well, I would. Now would. Now is me, Naoko Yasutani, which is my full name, but you can call me now because everyone else does. 
And I better tell you a little bit more about myself if we're going to keep on meeting like this. Actually, not much has changed. I'm still sitting in this French maid cafe in Akiba Electricity Town, and Edith Piloff is singing another sad chanson, and Babette just brought me a coffee, and I've taken a sip. Babette is my maid, and also my new friend. And my coffee is Blue Mountain, and I drink it black, which is unusual for a teenage girl, but it's definitely the way good coffee should be drunk if you have any respect for the bitter bean. <laughs> I've pulled up my sock and scratched behind my knee. I have straightened my pleats so that they line up neatly on the tops of my thighs. I've tucked my shoulder length hair behind my right ear, which is pierced with five holes, but now I'm letting it fall modestly across my face again because the otaku salaryman who's sitting at the table next to me is staring and it's creeping me out, even though I find it amusing too. I'm wearing my junior high school uniform, and I can tell by the way he's looking at my body that he's got a major schoolgirl fetish. And if that's the case, then how come he's hanging out at a French maid cafe? I mean, what a dope. But you never can tell. Everything changes, and anything is possible, so maybe I'll change my mind about him, too. Maybe in the next few minutes, he will lean awkwardly in my direction and say something surprisingly beautiful to me and I will be overcome with a fondness for him in spite of his greasy hair and bad complexion. And I'll actually condescend to converse with him a little bit, and eventually he will invite me to go shopping. And if he can convince me that he's madly in love with me, I'll go to a department store with him and let him buy me a cute cardigan sweater or a k-tie or a handbag, even though he obviously doesn't have a lot of money. And then, after, maybe we'll go to a club and drink some cocktails and zip into a love hotel with a big jacuzzi. And after we bathe, just as I begin to feel comfortable with him, suddenly his true inner nature will emerge and he'll tie me up and put the plastic shopping bag from my new cardigan <laughs> over my head and rape me. And hours later, the police will find my li lifeless naked body bent at odd angles on the floor <laughs> next to the big, round, zebra skin bed. Or... Maybe he'll just ask me to strangle him a little with my panties while he gets off on their beautiful aroma. <laughs> or maybe none of these things will happen except in my mind and yours because, like I told you, together we're making magic, at least for the time being. Three. Are you still there? I just reread what I wrote about the otaku salary man, and I want to apologize. That was nasty. That was not a nice way to start. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not a stupid girl. I know Edith Pilaf's name isn't really Pilaf. And I'm not a nasty girl or a hentai either. I'm actually not a big fan of hentai. So if you are one, then please just put this book down immediately and don't read any further, OK? You will only be disappointed and wasting your time because this book is not going to be some kinky girl's secret diary filled with pink fantasies and nasty fetishes. It's not what you think, since my purpose for writing it before I die is to tell someone the fascinating life story of my 104-year-old great-grandmother, who is a Zen Buddhist nun. You probably don't think nuns are all that fascinating, but my great-grandmother is, and not in a kinky way at all. <laughs> I'm sure there are lots of kinky nuns out there. Well, maybe not so many kinky nuns, but kinky priests for sure. <laughs> kinky priests are everywhere. But my diary will not concern itself with them or their freaky behaviors. This diary will tell the real life story of my great grandmother, Yasutani Jiko. She was a nun and a novelist and a new woman of the Taisho era. She was also an anarchist and a feminist who had plenty of lovers, both males and females, but she was never kinky or nasty. And even though I may end up mentioning some of her love affairs, everything I write will be historically true and empowering to women, and not a lot of foolish geisha crap. So, if nasty kinky things are your pleasure, please just close this book and give it to your wife or coworker and save yourself a lot of time and trouble. <laughs> I think it's important to have clearly defined goals in life, don't you? Especially if you don't have a lot of life left. Because if you don't have clear goals, you might run out of time. And when the day comes, you'll find yourself standing on the parapet of a tall building or sitting on your bed with a bottle of pills in your hands thinking, shit, I blew it. If only I'd set clearer goals <coughs> for myself. 
<laughs> I'm telling you this because actually I'm not going to be around for long and you might as well know this up front so you don't make any assumptions. Assumptions suck. They're like expectations. Assumptions and expectations will kill any relationship. So let's you and me not go there, okay? The truth is that very soon I'm going to graduate from time. Or maybe I shouldn't say graduate because that makes it sound as if I've actually met my goals and deserve to move on when the fact is I just turned 16 and I've accomplished nothing at all. Zilch. Nada. Do I sound pathetic? I don't mean to. I just want to be accurate. Maybe instead of graduate, I should say I'm going to drop out of time. Drop out? Time out? Exit my existence. I'm counting the moments. One, two, three, four. Hey, I know. Let's count the moments together. Ruth. One. A tiny sparkle caught Ruth's eye. A small glint of refracted sunlight angling out from beneath a massive tangle of drying bull kelp, which the sea had heaved up onto the sand of full tide. She mistook it for the sheen of a giant dying jellyfish and almost walked right by it. The beaches were overrun with jellyfish these days, the monstrous red stinging kind that looked like wounds along the shoreline. But something made her stop. She leaned over and nudged the heap of kelp with the toe of her sneaker and then poked at it with a stick. Untangling the whip-like fronds, she dislodged enough to see that what glistened underneath was not a dying sea jelly, but something plastic, a bag. Not surprising, the ocean was full of plastic. She dug a bit more until she could lift the bag up by its corner. It was heavier than she expected a scarred plastic freezer bag encrusted with barnacles that spread across its surface like a rash. It must have been in the ocean for a long time, she thought. Inside the bag, she could see a hint of something red, someone's garbage, no doubt, tossed overboard or left behind after a picnic or a rave. The sea was always heaving things up and hurling them back. Fishing lines, floats, beer cans, plastic toys, tampons, Nike sneakers, a few years earlier, it was severed feet. People were finding them up and down Vancouver Island, washed up on the sand. One had been found on this very beach. No one could explain what had happened to the rest of the bodies. Ruth didn't want to think about what might be rotting inside the bag. She flung it further up the beach. She would finish her walk and then pick it up on the way back, take it home, and throw it out. Two. What's this? her husband called from the mudroom. Ruth was cooking dinner, chopping carrots, and concentrating. This, Oliver repeated when she didn't answer. She looked up. He was, he was standing in the doorway of the kitchen, dangling the large, scarred freezer bag in his fingers. She'd left it out on the porch, intending to deposit it in the trash, only she'd gotten distracted. Oh, leave it, she said. It's garbage, something I picked up on the beach. Please don't bring it in the house. <coughs> Why did she have to explain? <coughs> but there's something in it, he said. Don't you want to know what's inside? No, she said. Dinner's almost ready. He brought it in anyway and laid it on the kitchen table, scattering sand. He couldn't help it. It was his nature to need to know, to take things apart and sometimes put them back together again. Their freezer was filled with plastic shrouds containing the tiny carcasses of birds, shrews, and other small animals that the cat had brought in waiting to be dissected and stuffed. It's not just one bag, he reported, carefully unzipping the first and laying it aside. It's bags within bags. The cat, attracted by all the activity, jumped up onto the table to help. He wasn't allowed on the table. The cat had a name, Schrodinger, but they never used it. Oliver called him the pest, which sometimes morphed into pesto. He was always doing bad things disemboweling squirrels in the middle of the kitchen, leaving small, shiny organs, kidneys, or intestines right outside their bedroom door where Ruth would step on them with her bare feet on her way to the bathroom at night. They were a team, Oliver and the cat. When Oliver went upstairs, the cat went upstairs. When Oliver came downstairs to eat, the cat came downstairs to eat. When Oliver went outside to pee, the cat went outside to pee. Now, 
Ruth watched the two of them as they examined the contents of the plastic bags. She winced, anticipating the stench of someone's rotting picnic, or worse, that would ruin the fragrance of their meal. Lentil soup. They were having lentil soup and salad for dinner, and she'd just put in the rosemary. Do you think you could dissect your garbage out on the porch? You picked it up, he said. And anyway, I don't think it's garbage. It's too neatly wrapped, he continued, his forensic unpeeling. Ruth sniffed, but all she could smell was sand and salt and sea. Suddenly, he started laughing. Look, Pesto, he said, it's for you. It's a Hello Kitty lunchbox. <laughs> Please, Ruth said, feeling desperate now. And there's something inside. I'm serious. I don't want you to open it up in here. Take it out. But it was too late. Three. He had smoothed the bags flat, laid them out on top of one another in descending order of size, and then sorted the contents into three neat collections a small stack of handwritten letters, a pudgy bound book with a faded red cover, a sturdy antique wristwatch with a matte black face and a luminous dial. Next to these sat the Hello Kitty lunchbox that had protected the contents from the corrosive effects of the sea. The cat was sniffing at the lunchbox. Ruth picked him up and dropped him on the floor and then turned her attention to the items on the table. The letters appeared to be written in Japanese. The cover of the red book was printed in French. The watch had markings etched onto the back that were difficult to decipher, so Oliver had taken out his iPhone and was using the microscope app to examine the engraving. I think this is Japanese too, he said. Ruth flipped through the letters, trying to make out the characters that were written in a faded blue ink. The handwriting's old and cursive, beautiful, but I can't understand a word of it. She put the letters down and took the watch from him. Yes, she said. They're Japanese numbers. Not a date, though. Yon, nana, san, hachi, nana. Four, seven, three, eight, seven. Maybe a serial number? She held the watch up to her ear and listened to the ticking, but it was broken. She put it down and picked up the bright red lunchbox. The red color showing through the scarred plastic was what had, made her, what, was what had led her to mistake the freezer bag for a stinging jellyfish. How long it had been floating out there in the ocean before washing up. The lunchbox lid had a rubber gasket around the rim. She picked up the book, which was surprisingly dry. The cloth cover was soft and worn, its corners blunt from rough handling. She put the edge to her nose and inhaled the musty scent of mildewed pages and dust. She looked at the tarnished gilt title embossed on the red cloth spine. A la recherche du temps perdu, she read, by Marcel Proust. Her French wasn't great, but she opened the cover anyway, curious to see if she could understand just the first few lines. She was expecting to see an age-stained folio printed in an antique font, so she was entirely unprepared for the adolescent purple handwriting that sprawled across the page. It felt like a desecration, and it shocked her so much she almost dropped the book. Hi, she read. My name is Nell, and I'm a time being. Do you know what a time being is? <laughs> so that's the... So that's the sort of dialogue that's been set up between these two characters, Nal and, and Ruth. And um, how, how are we doing for time? Do, uh, there's another section that I can read if, if you if you still have an appetite for a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I'll, I will jump ahead and um, and read another section of now, which is uh, which is set in uh, in Japan. Now is a um, you know is a, is a uh, you know a very troubled teenager um, who has decided that she is going to um, going to commit suicide. Um, she's being bullied in school. Uh, she grew up in Silicon Valley. She grew up in, in Sunnyvale, California, but her, and her father was a computer programmer. He lost his job, and um, the family was forced to move back to Tokyo, and where now was put into, uh, into middle school, into junior high school. Um, she speaks Japanese, but she's completely unprepared for, uh, you know, for the, the cultural transition. And so she's being, she's being severely bullied in school. Um, and so she decides that the only way to, to deal with this is to commit suicide. But before she does, she wants to do one last act of redemption, which is to tell the life story of her 104-year-old great-grandmother, uh, old Jiko. So um, 
In this next scene, uh, now has been sent to old Jiko's um, temple, okay, in uh, in northern Japan, and uh, old Jiko is is um, in, in a way, old Jiko is is the only uh, trustworthy adult in Nao's life, and old Jiko is helping Nao sort of cope with her problems, and um, she's taught Nao how to meditate, um, only she hasn't really talked about it like that. Um, old Jiko has has uh, has has told now that she needs a superpower, okay, and that her superpower is going to be this this superpower of meditation. Um, so there's a little bit of a reference to that. Now, <clears throat> one. Have you ever tried to bully a wave? Punch it, kick it, pinch it, hit it, beat it to death with a stick? Stupid. After old Jiko found my scars, she took me on an errand into town. On the way back, she wanted to stop and buy some rice balls and soft drinks and some chocolate treats. She had this idea that we could take the bus to the seaside and have a picnic there. I didn't particularly care, but she seemed to think it would be a big treat for me to eat store-bought food and play by the ocean. So I was like, whatever, you know, willing to go along because it's hard to disappoint someone who's 104 <coughs> years old. <laughs> because of her cataracts, Jiko can't really walk very well, and, she's always, and she always carries a stick. But what she really likes is when you hold hands with her. I think holding hands makes her feel more confident, and so I got into the habit of holding her hand when I was next to her. And to tell you the truth, I liked it too. I liked the feeling of her thin little fingers in mine. I liked being the strong one and keeping her tiny body close to me. It made me feel useful. When I wasn't there, she used her stick. I like feeling more useful than a stick. <laughs> Before getting on the bus to the seaside, Jiko wanted to stop at the family mart in town to buy our picnic, but there happened to be a gang of Yankee girls hanging out in the parking lot in front, so I lied and said I wasn't hungry. They were speed tribe biker chicks with bleached orange and yellow shaggy hair and baggy construction worker pants and big flapping lab coats that looked like the kind that doctors and scientists wear, only they weren't white. They were neon bright and graffitied all over with giant black kanji. The girls were squatting on the pavement by the door, chewing gum and smoking. A couple of them were leaning on wooden swords, the kind you use for kendo, and I was like, no way, Grandma, I'm really not hungry. But old Jiko had her heart set on making a picnic for me, so what could I do? I held her little hand real tight, and when we got near the girls, one of them spat, and it landed at our feet. And then they started to say stuff. It was nothing I hadn't heard at school before, but it shocked me because of old Jiko being so old. And how can you say rude stuff about Monkle and Chin Chin to an old lady who's a nun? It took us forever to get past them because Jiko walked so slow, and they were kind of blocking our way. They kept on shouting out and spitting, and I could feel my heart racing and my face growing hot, even if old Jiko didn't bat an eyelid. Finally, we made it into the family mart. The whole time we were looking for rice balls and drinks and deciding whether to buy chocolate or sweet bean cakes or both for dessert, I kept looking through the window at the girls squatting outside the store. I knew that when we left, they would say more stuff to us. Maybe they would throw things at us or trip us. Maybe they would follow us to the beach and get their boyfriends to rape us and beat us and throw our dead bodies into the ocean. Or maybe they would just do the business themselves with their wooden swords. I'd gotten plenty of practice at school imagining this kind of thing happening to my own body, so it didn't bother me that much. But the idea of someone hurting my old Jiko was brand new to my mind, and it made me feel like throwing up. But old Jiko wasn't paying any attention. She was concentrating on selecting the flavors of our rice balls, and eventually she decided on sour plums, flavored seaweed, and spicy cod roe. She wanted me to choose some chocolate treat, either pokki or melty kisses or both, but how could I focus on something so unimportant? I had to protect us from our enemies outside the door, even if she was too old and blind to comprehend the danger we were in. And I was trying to calculate my chances of fighting off a dozen Yankee bitches with serious sticks when all I had was my pathetic little superpower. It took forever for Jiko to pay the cashier. You know how it is with old people and their coin purses. <laughs> but I didn't mind or offer to help. 
I was kind of hoping that maybe she would take all day, all day, and by the time we'd finished, the gang would have gone, but no such luck. They were still there, squatting on the pavement, and the minute we walked out of the store, they kind of locked onto us, spitting and sizing us up. I tried to hurry Chico past them, but you know old Chico, she always takes her time. The girls started calling out, and as we got closer, their cries grew louder and more screechy, and a couple of the squatting ones got to their feet. I moved up in front, but when we were even with them, suddenly, old Chico stopped. She turned to face them, peering as if she was noticing them for the first time, and then she tugged on my hand and started shuffling in their direction. I held back, whispering, Dame da yo, obachama, ikoyo, but she didn't listen. She went up and stood right in front of them and gave them a long look, which is how she looks at everything, long and steady, probably on account of the time it takes for an image to form through the milky lenses of her cataracts. <laughs> the girls in their neon-colored pants and blue and orange and red mechanical coats with the big black kanji must just have been a confusion of lines and bright colors to her eyes. No one said anything. The girls were jutting out their chins and hips and shifting restlessly from side to side. Finally, I guess old Jiko understood what she was looking at. She dropped my hand, and I held my breath, and then she bowed. I couldn't believe it. It wasn't a little bow, either. It was a deep bow. The girls were like, what the fuck? <laughs> One of them, a fat girl sitting in front, kind of nodded back. Not quite a bow, not completely respectful, but not a punch in the face, either. But then the tall one in the middle, who was clearly the girl boss, reached over and gave the fat one a swift punch in the head. Nametendo ka, she snarled. Chuta hampa nanda yo, chanto ojiki mo dekinai no ka. She smacked the fat girl once more, and then she stood up straight, put her palms together, and bowed deeply from the waist. The rest of her crew jumped up and did the same. Jiko bowed to them again and nudged me, so I bowed too. But I did it half-assed, so she made me do it again, which made things even, because now it was like old Jiko was the girl boss of our gang, and I was the fat <laughs> screw-up who couldn't bow properly. <laughs> I didn't think this was so funny, but the gangbangers thought it was hilarious, and Jiko smiled too. And then she took my hand, and we walked on. When the bus came, Jiko sat by the window and looked out at the parking lot. I wonder what omatsuri it is today, she said. <laughs> Omatsuri? <laughs> yes, she said. Those pretty young people dressed in their matsuri clothes. They look so gay. I wonder what the occasion is. Muji remembers these things for me. It's not a matsuri. Those were gangbangers, Granny. Bike chicks. Yankee girls. They were girls? <laughs> Bad girls. Juvenile delinquents. They were saying stuff. I thought they were going to beat us up. Oh, no, Jiko said, shaking her head. They were dressed so nicely, such cheerful colors. <laughs> <laughs> Two. <coughs> Have you ever bullied a wave? Jiko asked me at the beach. We had eaten rice balls and chocolate and were hanging out. Jiko was sitting on a small wooden bench, and I was lying on the sand at her feet. The sun was beating down. Jiko had tied a damp white hand towel around her bald head and seemed as cool as a cucumber in her gray pajamas. I was hot and sweaty and feeling restless, but I hadn't brought a bathing suit and didn't really want to go for a swim. But that's not what she was asking. <coughs> Bullied a wave, I repeated. No, of course not. Mm, try it. Go to the water and wait for the biggest wave and give it a punch. Give it a good kick. Hit with stick. Go, I will watch. <laughs> she handed me her walking stick. There was no one around except for a couple of surfers way down the beach. I took old Jiko's stick in my hand and walked and then ran to the edge of the ocean, waving it above my head like a kendo sword. The waves were big, breaking on the beach, and I ran into the first one that came at me, yelling, Kiai! like a samurai going into battle. I smacked the wave with the stick, cutting through it, but the water kept on coming. I ran back up the beach and escaped, but the next one knocked me over. I got to my feet and attacked it again and again, and each time the water crashed down on top of me, grinding me against the rocks and covering me with foam and sand. I didn't mind. 
the sharp cold felt good, and the violence of the waves felt powerful and real, and the bitterness of salt in my nose tasted harshly delicious. Over and over I ran at the sea, beating it until I was so tired I could barely stand. And then the next time I fell down, I just lay there and let the waves wash over me, and I wondered what would happen if I stopped trying to get up, just let my body go. Would I be washed out to sea? The sharks would eat my limbs and organs. Little fish would feed on my fingertips. My beautiful white bones would fall to the bottom of the ocean where anemones would grow upon them like flowers. Pearls would rest in my eye sockets. I stood up and walked back to where old Jiko was sitting. She took the small towel from her head and handed it to me. Maketa, I said, throwing myself down on the sand. I lost. The ocean won. She smiled. Was it a good feeling? Mm, I said. Mm, good, she said. Have another nice board. <laughs> Three. We sat there for a while longer, waiting for my shorts and t-shirt to dry. Down the beach, in the distance, the surfers kept falling into the water and disappearing. The waves keep beating them up, too, I said, pointing. Jiko squinted, but she couldn't see them through her cataracts. There, I said. See that one? He's standing up, up, up. No, he's down. I laughed. It was funny to watch. Jiko nodded like she was agreeing with me. Mm, up, down. Same thing, she said. It's a typical Jiko comment, all about pointing to what she calls the not-to nature of existence when I'm just trying to watch some cute guys surfing. I know better than to argue with her because she always wins, but it's like a knock-knock joke where you have to say who's there so the other person can tell you the punchline. So I said, no, it's not the same thing, not for the surfer. Mm, yes, she said, you are right, not the same. She adjusted her glasses. Not different, either. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> it is different, Granny. The whole point of surfing is to stand up on top of the wave, not underneath it. Mm, Safa, <clears throat> wave, same thing. <laughs> I don't know why I bother. That's just stupid, I said. A surfer is a person. A wave is a wave. How can they be the same? Jiko looked out across the ocean to where the water met the sky. A wave is born from deep condition of ocean, she said. A person is born from deep condition of the world. A person pokes up from the world and rolls along like wave until it is time to sink down again. Up, down, person, wave. She pointed to the steep cliffs along the shoreline. Jiko, mountain. Same thing. Mountain is tall and will live a long time. Jiko is small and will not live much longer. That's all. Like I said, this is pretty typical of the kind of conversation you have with my old Jiko. I never completely understand what she's saying, but I like that she tries to explain it to me anyway. It's nice of her. It was time to go back to the temple. My shorts and t-shirt had dried out and my skin was super itchy from the salt. I helped Jiko to her feet and we walked to the bus stop together, holding hands again. I was still thinking about what she had said about waves and it made me sad because I knew that her little wave was not going to last and soon she would join the sea again. And even though I know you can't hold on to water, still I gripped her fingers a little more tightly to keep her from leaking away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.